Well, good evening. And I'll be bringing a message this night, tonight on uh, service and servants. Uh, pastor asked me about a month ago to uh, fill in the pulpit here. So, um, faithful servant, I'm here <laughs> at uh, Pastor's request. Um, preaching's not necessarily my thing, but um, I'm a willing servant to fill in. Um, so, um, I was talking to Brother Tim before the service tonight, and uh, the COVID-19 has shut down a lot of churches, and maybe 30 to 40 percent of churches are actually going back to meeting, if meeting at all. That's just broad spectrum churches across the country. Um, but as our church goes back to services and goes back to serving, I thought it'd be good to have a message on serving and servants. Um, let's just uh, pray before we start here. Heavenly Father, just to uh, Thank you for the opportunity to open your word tonight and look at service and service. Lord, I just humbly come and preach at this pulpit, Lord. Um, I take no glory in preaching here, Lord, but to just bring glory to your name from your word. Just bring this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what is a servant? Uh, in the New Testament, the word for servant that is most commonly used is the Greek word doulos, which means to bind. It also came to mean one who gives himself up to the will of another and became the most common word for servant in general without any idea of bondage attached to it, basically a willing slave. So I'm going to go through a list here of um, what is biblical service. Um, from Hebrews 6.10, the Bible says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed towards his name, that ye have ministered to the saints and to minister. So it is caring for others out of love, caring for others in the church family, to bring glory to God's name and not our own. Um, you know, I was thinking of my, my friend Tom, and I spent one whole summer um, just going over and cutting Tom's grass. It was a pain in the neck. It was that deep, and his neighbors didn't like me cutting the grass at the right time or whatever, but you know, it was an opportunity to um, just go over and spend a little bit of time with Tom. You know, and through that, avenues opened up, and I was able to lead time to the Lord, um, a very inconvenient thing to do, but the Lord requires inconvenience of us a lot. Um, um, Matthew 23, 10 through 12 says, Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ, but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Um, it is being a servant of Jesus Christ for him and to him, a humble servant, and not putting ourselves out there for show. Um, it is giving all that we have, um, what we would say, our time, our finances, our resources. And those are things that we would say, you know, things that we think belong to us. But in reality, but as a born-again believer in Christ Jesus, he is our master. We should then say his time, his finances, his resources, and, O oh Lord, I willingly ask, what would you have me to do? Luke 6, 6 38 uh, says, Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet out, with it shall be measured unto you again. Um, so, how do we decide what pattern we use for uh, service? Um, but we are created in God's image, so we can follow that example. Um, we're created in the image of God. Part of the image is how Jesus Christ, the Savior, um, the Son of God, serves. In Genesis 26, 28, we'll see the relationship between uh, Jesus and the Father. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the living thing, every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So we are created in the image of God, the image of Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is the perfect example of service, and in obedience to the Father's will, he gave all of his life for us. 
Um, the Bible says in Mark 10, 35 to 45, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldst do for us whatsoever we shall desire. He said unto them, What would you that I would do for you? They said unto him, Grant us that we may sit one on the right hand and the other on the left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, You know not what you speak. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, You shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of and with the baptism that I am baptized. With all shall you be baptized. But sit on the right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them of whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to much be displeased with James and John. But Jesus called to them, called them to him and said unto them, You know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so it shall not be among you, but, whos, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That role of service there that Jesus has done for us. Service in the name of Christ will require much from us, if not all that we have and all that we are. Many of Christ's servants down through the ages have given all, sacrificed all, given their lives for Christ, so that others may know Christ as Savior. It is being found loving, joyful, pleasant, zealous, serving, and prayerful. Romans 12, 9 through 18, it speaks about these. Um, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints and given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be the same mind one toward another, mind not high things, but do not consent, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men, and if it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. And I'm just thinking, you know, with all these different mandates and things that we've had from our governor and our governments and all these things that have been pressed upon us, um, we still need to serve. We still need to serve them um, willingly, joyfully, prayerfully, zealously. Um, you know, we think about the, uh, the difficulties we have in, in ministry. Uh, I just put a little note down here, you know, December is about the, the worst time for me. I get a little bit depressed during December. And, you know, coming out on Wednesday night, uh, I say to Johanna, we have to go to prayer meeting tonight. You know, we could pray at home. You know, and, and, you know, I talk to some of the youth workers and the kids workers. You know, it's, it's such a drag to come. You know, the kids are unruly and they're wild and, you know, get in the van and the snow and ice and everything. But those are requirements of service, to come even when it's inconvenient and we're tired and we're dragged out. We must still come and serve, but not not for personal gain and not because we have to. We serve because we love the Lord and we want others to come to know the Lord as well. Um, it's also uh, living out the fruit of the Spirit. Um, as believers, it's not a, uh, a choice, it's a requirement to live out the fruit of the Spirit. Um, God's children will be found doing good works to those outside of God's family and inside God's family. Uh, the Bible says, Galatians 6, 7 through 10, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh, shall the flesh, flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are out of the household of faith. It's Christian servants willingly serving their enemies with an agenda in mind. So um, I, I was thinking last night of a, a neighbor that we had growing up. This man, well, his name was Donald. We, we called him Donald Duck or Ducky. 
I, the man's still alive. He's my mom's neighbor. And uh, this man's wicked, vile. Um, he had a son that went and murdered and raped a woman. And this man tried covering up for him. Um, but he was just a vile, dishonest man. He lied. He cheated. Never worked a day in his life. He ripped off the system. But, you know, my dad would go over and help him tune up a snowblower. He'd help him shovel his walk. He'd help him fix anything. He would incessantly talk to him about the Bible over the fence. You know, the gentleman's still not saved, but, you know, the man heard the gospel. At least God is still gracious with this man. But it's those opportunities, even when this man really is an enemy, it's still... Uh, my dad did service to him and uh, witnessed to him. Um, Luke 6.35 says, But love your enemy, enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward should be great, and you should be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. There is heaven reward in serving your enemies, and also our testimony to them to win them for Christ. It is doing good works as saved servants. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Um, I would venture to say that born again believers are the only ones that can do good works. And my wife and I have this discussion all the time. Um, and she says, well, people do good works. And I says, well, they do, they do works. I says, the good works of it, it talks about here can only be done by believers. Um, now the unregenerate man can only do works. Uh, it is through a believer's relationship in Christ Jesus that allows him to do the good works. And then I tell my wife, it's just my opinion, but um, it is serving willingly. Um, one of the uh, aspects of being a servant and the Bible says in Colossians 3, 23 through 24, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Whatsoever is all-encompassing, our jobs, ministry, helping our neighbors and family, doing the lowest and most miserable tasks. I know pastors asked for help doing some of the different ministry aspects here need some help cleaning and doing different things. Those are all jobs of service. Where to do them heartily is under the Lord. And God's servants must serve others as if we were serving God in person. Matthew 25, 42 through 45 says, For I was in hunger, he gave me no meat. I was thirsty, he gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and he took me not in. Naked, and he clothed me not. Sick and in prison, he visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, and so much as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. Um, I've heard pastors speak of driving along the interstate and going down a, a ramp and seeing a man there in need and... and Going back and thinking about it, you know, going back the next day thinking, no, I, I should really give that man some money and, and be of service to him, you know, and the man was gone, and those, those opportunities are gone once they're passed. So um, when there's opportunities to serve, buy them up. Um, the Lord will be glorified. Um, there's heavenly reward in it, even if it does empty our pockets and our strength sometimes. There is heavenly reward in it. Um, it is faithful in giving. Not only faithful, but joyful in giving. Second Corinthians 9, 7 through 9 says, Every man, according as he purpose in his heart, to let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver, as God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As is written, He that is dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness, righteousness remains forever. Um, we're to be available as servants. Um, it is being found available. Each believer will hear the call of God for service. Not necessarily a call in the middle of the night, but as opportunities come or as 
We uh, read the scriptures, or as uh, the church says, we have need in an area, and you pray about it, and open up those opportunities of service. Isaiah 6, 8 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. That should be a, a, a sound from our voices often that says, Here am I. Um, I'm guilty of not saying that enough. I'm guilty of saying no, or Lord, I've got to think about it, or Lord, I've got to pray about it for a couple years, or um, Lord, here am I. I know when I came to church here, a preacher asked me a couple times, would you preach? I said, it's not my thing. And he asked me again, would you preach? Well, I've got to pray about it. Then pastor got good and sick, and we needed people to fill the pulpit. And I said, yes, Lord, I'm here. I will serve. So, um, so those that answer the call, some godly examples here. I just have a couple of brief synopsis here. So Abraham, Abraham obeyed God, even when it didn't make sense, even when it came at great cost. Abraham was willing to sacrifice what was most precious to him, his home, even his beloved son, to follow God and to trust his plans. We find that in Genesis uh, chapters 12 to 22. Job, um, Job kept his eyes fixed on God, trusting in his goodness and sovereignty, despite the depth of his suffering. When everyone around him let him down, even his own wife, who said, curse God and die, um, he never wavered in his faithfulness to God and his hope in him. Samuel, Samuel was quick to answer God's call, presenting himself as a willing servant at the mention of his name. He was willing to serve God in whatever way he was asked and did it with a humble and grateful heart. And that's from Samuel chapter 3, or 1 Samuel chapter 3. Mary, when Mary was visited by an angel telling her that she would become pregnant by the Holy Spirit and give birth to God's son, the response came from Luke 138. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel of the Lord departed from her. When Mary said this, she knew that she would pay a great price. At best, her reputation would be destroyed. At worst, she was risking her very life since the law would sanction her stoning. But she trusted God's purpose for her, no matter what the cost. We find that in Luke 1, 26 through 38. The Apostle Paul, Paul served God faithfully by preaching the gospel wherever and whenever the Lord directed him. He kept his eyes fixed on Christ and his mission on the truth and love, even through great trial and persecution, ultimately giving his life for the gospel. It was Paul who most clearly defined for us in Scripture what it meant to be a servant of Christ and demonstrated it relentlessly in his own life. Romans 1, 1 says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Um, and finally, we uh, have Jesus as our example of servant, saving the best for last year. Jesus is undeniably the clearest and most beautiful example of true servanthood we have to emulate. John 15, 19 says, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. And the Bible says in Philippians 2, 6 through 8, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus, though he was God himself incarnate, he submitted himself completely to the will of his Father, becoming a servant, a willing slave, the very incarnation of love itself. He was patient, kind, long-suffering, forgiving. He gave himself for us, even unto death, even the death of the cross. And he did it by choice. So how can, be, we, how can we be faithful servants of God? Being a servant of God is not defined by what I do, but by who I am. It is not about the productivity of hands, but a posture of heart. Many times serving God will involve actual work, but if the work is not prompted by the Spirit and carried out in true love and humility, it is merely an empty task of vainglory. I know I've done many service opportunities because I was asked to and just did them and did them in my own strength and had the life sucked right out of me. And yet other times I've served the Lord joyously and have gone days with a couple hours of sleep here or there to serve the Lord and 
just keep going on serving, and then God provides the strength. He provides uh, everything else needed, to, the funds or whatever, to, to serve. Um, but I've, I've experienced both, and I would rather serve um, out of humility and love for the Father than out of my own will. Being a faithful servant of God is less about what we are doing and more about why we are doing it. How, how are we doing it and who we're doing it for? Your honest answers to these questions reflect the definition of love uh, we will find in 1 Corinthians 13 that we are truly servants. And that's the, uh, the love chapter that we find in Corinthians there. So to what extent do we serve? And this is the main reason I'm preaching this sermon. Um, years ago, I, I came across a verse in the passage here. It's in 1 Corinthians 16, 15 through 18. It says, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruit, that he, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that ye submit yourselves unto such, and to every one that helpeth with us and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunus and Achaeus, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge ye them that are so much. So how do we serve in the New Testament church? The church at Corinth was a new thing. There had never been a church there before. There was a, a New Testament church started there, but there was a Jewish synagogue and the pagan temples of worship. There were many gods with temples built for each. Corinth was a wealthy city with extravagant lifestyles full of lust and desire. Lifestyle Christianity was new to the believers at Corinth. They did not have the New Testament as we have today, but they did have God's word in the Old Testament. But for new converts that were not of Jewish descent, they had little to govern their lives. So Paul wrote to a church giving them direction on Christian life, now in the, Christian life now in the New Testament church. Stephanus was one of these new believers. So if you can imagine uh, our missionaries out starting a new church, and also they have somebody saved. So Stephanus was one of the new believers, one of the first fruits. He and his household were baptized by Paul, and he served faithfully. Stephanus was probably the head of the household from what we can figure in 1 Corinthians there. And I, I found this interesting. Often if a head of household was saved, the rest of the household would follow and be saved as well from, from their testimony. But if a servant or slave were saved, oftentimes they were beaten for their belief in Christ. So what pattern would Stephanus have followed for Christian living? We can guess that he followed the teachings of the apostles, which was the life of Christ. Stephanus was a faithful servant, but more than that, he lived and breathed the Christian life in the local church. We find many organized religions that life and lifestyle revolve around that particular religion, most as a method of earning merit or favor with their God or trying to earn their way to heaven. Um, in our modern New Day Testament churches here, we seem to have watered down lifestyle Christianity a little bit. Much of, a, much of the world is crept in, slowly making a foothold here and there. Our lives are busy, and, and I will attest to this too. But with what? We find ourselves being entertained more and more via TV, internet, cell phones, sports, and health regimens. And at the bottom of the list is a couple hours a week where we worship God and read a little and pray a little, and time is gone. And... I find it difficult to take time to memorize scripture, and that's in my own doing. Um, the Lord gives us 24 hours a day, and it's up to us how we divide it out. Um, but I've been purposely trying to take more time to memorize scripture. I know Brother Kevin takes lots of time to memorize scripture. Um, um, but that is a good example to us. We have, we have no excuse. Um, so the hourglass is nearing its end. The Lord's return is at hand any moment now. Are we challenged more to live like Christ, to seek and to save the lost, to be the servant that Christ is? Our man Stephanus here was a new believer in a new venture called the church. He did not hold an office in the church, nor did he aspire to take over a leadership role. He may have had some means, or he may have came from a well-to-do family. Either way, he had a household, servants, and or slaves. He purposed to serve, serve the local church or whatever it had need of. We look at the conveniences of today, the ease of transportation. We have appliances, running water, books, cars, planes, trains, literature, cell phones. 
Stephanus' life was a life uh, more devoted to Christ. We look at the devotion of our occupations. Uh, I'm a nurse, and we work diligently at them. When we clock out, though, we go home. Our goals and mindset change to other things. So, yes, I'm a nurse for eight hours a day. When I clock out, I'm, well, I'm a nurse if you're having a heart attack, but that's about it. <laughs> uh, Stephanus and those with him were so involved to the point that they were called addicted to the ministry. Now, I work with addicted people, and um, they have cravings. I mean, they really have cravings for cigarettes, for booze, for drugs. Um, but to be so involved in the Lord's ministry, have a craving to serve the Lord in the church. Um, I've not yet experienced that, but I read this verse maybe three or four years ago and, and have pondered over it and sat over it. And, and preparing for this, I see a little more in light um, what it's meant by it, just to have that continuous serve, 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 nothing else but serve. How many times we find ourselves tired out and dragging ourselves through ministry. Stephanus, without a guidebook, lived service to the Lord, and he seemed no worse for the wear. He was so involved that he went from the church at Corinth to minister Paul at Ephesus. Now, we would just jump on a plane or you know, jump in an Uber or whatever. But it was no little feat considering in the era in which he lived, a distance of some 300 miles. Probably by foot and by sea. And uh, I have this nice pair of uh, custom-made cowboy boots here. Uh, they had sandals, and they probably weren't all that great, so a lot of the time he's probably barefoot, too. So a distance of 300 miles, um, no trains, planes, or automobiles. He was faithful to go and serve Paul. Now, this is really the only mention of Stephanus here, and Paul mentions him, I think, because of this faithfulness to come to him to minister to Paul and to minister in the church of Corinth. It says in verse 17 of... Uh, Chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaeus, for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. When Christ returns at any moment now, we, will he find us so much in love with our Savior that we are addicted to his ministry or we find us wanting? And I found this little, uh, little note here in some of the studies I was doing. It says that the, as the Second World War raged in Europe, England needed some more coal. Winston Churchill called a meeting with labor leaders and helped them imagine a day at the end of the war when the men who had won the war would parade through Piccadilly Circus. First, he said, would come sailors who had kept the seas open to the ships. Next would come soldiers who had fought with valor. After them would be the pilots who had defeated the Luftwaffe. Behind these heroes, everyone recognized, would follow men covered in soot and sweat. The crowd would ask, where were these men in those critical days of fighting? Each of the miners would stand with his heads held high and reply together, we were deep in the earth with our faces to the coal. In Colossians 4, uh, 12 through 18, we get a glimpse of servant men that were serving God's people in various roles. Um, the Bible says in Colossians 4, 12 through 18, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always, laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them that are in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, and Memphis, and the church which is in this house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also from the church of Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou, be, that thou fulfill it. So it talks about Luke here. It talks about um, Demas. It talks about some other men here. You know, Luke we know because he was a physician. And he's written about in the scriptures. Epaphras, just barely written about. Um, uh, Demas. Demas fell along the wayside. Um, so servants are important to God. They may appear great as Luke and say small and small to us, but all are of great importance to God, so much so that they are recorded here in God's Word. You know, we think of great men down through the ages. We think of great evangelists. and um, But there's other servants that aren't mentioned anywhere. But to God, they're just as important. Um, in 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 10, it says, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and it is departed unto Thessalonica. So we see Demas, he was a faithful servant, but he decided not to be a faithful servant and found the world more enticing. 
and left the service. I'm hoping as we go back to service here that um, we do not become like Demas, um, be too comfortable in our recliner chairs. I know my wife loved services on Sunday morning with a cup of tea and her pajamas on and a recliner and yeah, it's okay for a couple of Sundays when church is closed and we have to meet in other avenues, but um, I think we're done with those days. We need to get back to serving faithfully. Um, when we enter into the kingdom of heaven, what will our Lord say? And I read a, uh, a card this past week. Um, um, yeah, I'm short for words here. Um, yeah. uh, brother there, it was from, uh, it was a thank you card from, from you for your wife. Um, and, it, and it said in there, well done, thou good and faithful servant, from Matthew 25, 21. His Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. Enter thou in the joy of thy Lord. I was, I was singing of Peggy. Um, and uh, she was a very faithful servant. I know she had physical difficulties, but you know, every opportunity she had, she shared the gospel and where she could serve, she could, um, and, and took no rest in doing other things. So um, that's the end of my sermon here. Um, I'll close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, just thank you for this opportunity to open your word, Lord, open the scriptures to look at servanthood, Lord. And um, Lord, we all, and myself included, Lord, get comfortable in certain areas. And Lord, we decide what areas we will and will not do. And Lord, we should be more open, Lord, to your calling and what you desire us to do with your time, Lord, your money. Uh, and since you have purchased us, Lord, we are yours, Lord. We are your slaves and servants. And we are not of our own mind, Lord, and our own will, but of yours. May we keep that in mind as the days go forward, Lord, as, as opportunities arise, Lord. Um, you know, as other churches aren't meeting, Lord, um, people of other faiths are going to be looking, Lord, and having different thoughts on things. May we buy up those opportunities, Lord, to give out the gospel and to serve those in our community, Lord. Lord, we just think of our missionaries and how dedicated they are, Lord. And, uh, you know, we read each week, Lord, that they're out serving, they're out ministering, out going door to door, and, and people are being saved. And Lord, it's a, a pattern that uh, is, is followed from your word, Lord. And that's uh, what we're supposed to be doing. May we be found doing it, Lord, when you return. Lord, we know your return is imminent. It can be any time it can be before we come home this evening hour. Um, may we be found faithful, Lord, serving you. Just praise in Jesus' name. Amen.